This meeting is being recorded. Hi everyone. Um, we will wait the standard one or two minutes just to give people a chance to jump off of their previous Zoom calls um, and then we'll get going. So give us a minute. Well, look, it's uh, it's two minutes past, so why don't we get going? Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to FNA's eighth FMI broadcast. Now, uh, we are still live from uh, sunny Sevilla, where FNA is hosting its annual team event. Oh, sorry, my screen went funny there. Yes, uh, still here, still here in Sevilla. So it's great to be talking to you all from such a lovely location. Um, if you joined us yesterday, which um, I can see a few of you here did, uh, we had two great guests from Bank of England and SWIFT. Uh, today, again, we have two more wonderful guests for you, um, but as always, standard format for FNA, some housekeeping and a short intro from me. So I'm Anthony Harrison. I look after marketing here at FNA. Uh, this broadcast follows standard 60-minute format. Uh, Carlos here will, will be speaking to our two guests, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. Uh, for those of you who want to ask questions, and please, by all means, do. Um, if you're going to ask a question, please, please use the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. Um, don't use the chat function unless it's just to say hi. Um, it makes it a lot harder to track uh, the questions that come in. So use the Q&A widget, and then at the end, during the Q&A session, our guests will go through them and answer as many as we can in the time. Uh, next slide, please. So for those of you um, who maybe don't uh, know who FNA are, um, maybe this is your first session, I'll very quickly explain what we do before we jump into the discussion. Uh, so we are an advanced analytics and simulation technology company. We work across four core sectors, uh, mainly central banks, commercial banks, FMIs, and national security. Uh, related to this session, um, FMIs, challenger FMIs, uh, payment systems, uh, use our FMI lifecycle solutions to support every stage um, of their journey. So whether that's designing um, and validating the initial system design, building business cases for members, right the way through to latter stages, um, through to monitoring, ongoing monitoring, um, stress testing, and then of course optimizing and tweaking their system. So um, very short intro today, aware that, as I said, some of you were, were already at yesterday's session. So I think um, I'll hand you over to Carlos, um, who works here at FNA as Director of FMI and Digital Currency Solutions. Carlos um, will provide a quick intro into our speakers, and then we'll get the discussion kicked off. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. And Carlos, over to you. Anthony, thank you very much. Claudine, Patrick, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, let me first introduce Patrick. Patrick is uh, Head of Payments Oversight at the European Central Bank. And Claudine is Director of Infrastructures, Innovation and Payments at Bank Defense. Thank you, Claudine. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us. I hope we have a very nice, uh, organic, interesting conversation about oversight, which is the, the topic that uh, gathers us today. Before we start, uh, I would like to make a brief summary about what we're going to talk about. We all know that challenger FMIs are trying to solve long-lived issues in local and cross-border payments by implementing new technologies and business models. And that's where distributed ledger systems, blockchain and uh, atomic settlement and so on and so forth are, are coming our way. However, those technologies and business models remain untested and have not been overseen or regulated before. 
It is clear that the oversight of those FMIs and their systemic footprint is key to the safe and efficient functioning of local and cross-border payment systems. Today, what we're here to discuss is how the oversight function of central banks has to evolve to be able to cope with this new FMI ecosystem. That is, we're discussing what has been called in some documents by the ECB that I have been able to read, augmented oversight. That's perhaps one of one way to summarize what we're going to talk about today. So Patrick, Claudine, let me break the ice first. Uh, I don't know if you want to perhaps to introduce yourself and if you have any any uh, uh, comment to make about what we're going to talk or if you have to make some disclaimer regarding your affiliation, uh, this is the best moment to do it. Okay, first of all, um, thanks a lot, um, Carlos, for the introduction and uh, thanks for having invited me and um, I'm very pleased to also have Claudine with me, so uh, a true pleasure of mine. Um, um, Maybe I say a few words about uh, my work and um, the work that I do with my team. Um, so um, I'm working at the ECB's uh, Directorate General Market Infrastructure and Payments. Um, he has the pleasure to head payments oversight section. I do this with a team, with a diverse team of um, highly qualified and very motivated colleagues. And we are working for Europe. And working for Europe means um, we are working very closely um, with national centers um, and um, we do this for my small part of the business which is in particular to look after uh, the promoting sound payment systems and ensuring their safety and efficiency now what does that mean more concretely um, my team oversees um, the four systemically important payment systems um, several pan-European uh, payment schemes, um, and we do this jointly together with the national central banks and so-called joint oversight teams. Um, we conduct this oversight um, in a continuous way through a dialogue with the overseen entities and um, apply a three-step approach for those who know oversight, know this approach of collecting information, assessing this information, and promoting inducing change uh, where this is felt necessary. But one part of oversight, an important part of oversight also reflects to take a macro perspective and to look at the developments in the, in the market and how things are, are changing. So um, we therefore also analyze the market developments, um, developments that we see in view of, for instance, the safety of payment instruments. When we see new risks building up, like cyber resilience, we, we analyze interdependencies, I guess something that FNA is very closely related to. Um, we look at third party service providers. So number of aspects that we look at that are at macro level that concern the whole payments ecosystem. Um, of course, uh, in addition to this, um, we closely interact with and, and cooperate with uh, European authorities as well as internationally, for instance, with central banks uh, in the form of the G7, on the form of the, the Committee for Payments and Market Infrastructures in Basel to work together to develop standards um, and to also learn and well, um, this is a description of my of my work. Um, the several things are a few and may not be always fully um, um, the one um, of the ECB and your system. I just give this as a disclaimer and will of course was on the line where this is particular my personal view. And, but maybe I stop here for the introduction. Also looking for okay. Thank you, Claudine. So, hello everyone and uh, good afternoon. Very pleased to be uh, with you and also uh, having this, uh, this dialogue, uh, with virtual dialogue with, uh, with you and, and Patrick. So on my side, I'm the Director of Infrastructure Innovation and Payments at uh, Banque de France. Uh, I had um, a team of about uh, 100 people uh, with various, um, let's say, uh, various missions. Uh, first, we, we have the operational role of uh, running the, uh, the target uh, services for the, uh, the French community of banks. Uh, so this is most of the team uh, who work uh, well extensive hours. Um, then 
um, two divisions are dedicated to oversight, and I think we will speak about oversight a bit later on. Uh, oversight of payment instruments on one side and the oversight of uh, financial market infrastructures on the other side. So uh, FMIs, including, uh, of course, uh, payment systems. Uh, we have uh, one uh, CCP, uh, which is uh, LCHSA, uh, and we have one, one CSD. So we, we supervise uh, these on a domestic uh, basis, uh, also holding uh, some colleges for some of them. And uh, we, of course, participate in the uh, cooperative uh, oversight arrangements, including, of course, with the, uh, those which are under the ages of the, of the ECB. Um, and uh, there are two other aspects of my job or of my team. Uh, the one being the resilience uh, of, uh, of FMIs and of our sector. And of our, um, we are the, uh, we actually are, have the uh, secretariat of the uh, Paris uh, Resilience Group, uh, which involves uh, banks and FMIs. And so we organize um, uh, tests and crisis tests. And we are also here to handle a crisis should, uh, should this arise. So we, we have been very active in the matter. And finally, we are in the field of uh, digital assets. Um, so monitoring the, uh, the changes and the evolution of the landscape for crypto assets and what is happening uh, now in the markets and also working, uh, contributing to the uh, work of the, uh, the euro system work on the retail digital euro and working on uh, contributing to uh, uh, thoughts and reflections for a wholesale CBDC. So you probably heard that we have carried out uh, quite a few experiments on this aspect. So yes, this is basically the, the scope of, um, of the work within my directorate where we have a 360 degrees uh, view on uh, what, is, uh, what is going on. And as, uh, as Patrick uh, mentioned, uh, a lot of uh, changes going on in the landscape, uh, which uh, really calls for, uh, for the attention of uh, regulators and overseers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. That's very, very interesting. Uh, our first question is, uh, it's related to a discussion that we have with my good friend, Will, here at FNA, and that I know that it's at several central banks, including my uh, prior work at uh, for 16 years at the Oversight Department at the Central Bank of Colombia. It's a conceptual discussion. Mm -hmm. Is there any difference between supervision and oversight? And I know that in several central banks, which are not entitled of the supervision function, they say that they only do oversight and the super financial supervisor does supervision. Is there a conceptual difference between oversight and supervision at the end? <laughs> Let's start with you, Claudine. Well, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, question, Carlos. I think uh, we keep on asking ourselves also the, this question. And this was one of the questions that I asked when I, when I joined uh, the, the, the division uh, so, some time ago. Um, it's, it's interesting to, to recall as well that uh, in the CPMI IOSCO uh, principles for financial market infrastructures, it's mentioned indeed that uh, FMI should be subject to appropriate uh, regulation, supervision, and oversight uh, uh, by central banks, by market regulators, and other relevant authorities. So this shows that indeed these, uh, there seems to be a difference between the, the concepts. So maybe if we start historically, uh, well, oversight is mainly carried out, I should say, by, by central banks um, using um, moral suasion, uh, most, of, most of this, and um, having a, a based on soft law and uh, ensuring that uh, FMIs comply with uh, broad, uh, broad principles, uh, with uh, technical assessments uh, being, uh, being um, conducted. Uh, on the other hand, um, supervision is more in the field of um, uh, resting upon legal regulatory uh, text uh, with uh, some constraints constraints attached and with the uh, powers of sanctions uh, by the supervisor. Um, in practice, uh, indeed, um, maybe a, a separation between the roles with the oversight being um, a 
attributed to central banks, so with the soft power and uh, the prudential authorities uh, being allocated uh, the role of, uh, of uh, supervision. Um, however, this uh, distinction, I think, is, uh, has been blurring over time, and it's kind of um, uh, more or less uh, the, the two parts are, are joining. Effectively, uh, there are some uh, legal uh, uh, framework now which has uh, cropped up in, uh, in many uh, jurisdictions. Uh, among which uh, the European Union, uh, where some binding requirements have been set, uh, putting in, into a regulatory framework all the, uh, the PFMIs and uh, with powers of sanctions which have been allocated uh, to, to the authorities. So uh, the, I would say in, in a nutshell that the distinction is still relevant uh, in some aspects, but um, uh, surely central banks have been uh, given more and more power and their work is more and more looking like uh, supervision. That's my Thank you, Claudine. Yeah, my thank you, Claudine. Very interesting. <laughs> Patrick, what's your view on this? Uh, thank you. I, I agree that this is a difficult question and um, probably you ask uh, different people and you get different replies. Um, my reply will not be too different it was one from Claudine, I must say. Um, and just in, in parenthesis, I think I'm cutting out a few times. Let me know if I do, and then I will have to switch off my video. Of, um, of oversight that we still use, and that goes back to the CPMI, to a report from CPMI, but this time CPSS from 2005. And, um, there it says, oversight is a central bank function whereby the objectives of safety and efficiency are promoted by monitoring existing and planned systems, assessing them against these standards, and when necessary, inducing change. So this is Patrick, from you just, of how to distinguish your sound is a little bit cheapy. Mm -hmm. Let me try this. Is this any better right now? It seems so. Yeah, let's go that way. Let me, let me try. Um, so um, I hope you got the definition. I will not recall it, otherwise uh, you find it in the report. But I think there are um, some aspects of how oversight can be distinguished from supervision. Um, the first, um, I think as Claudine said, oversight is an essential function of the central bank whereas supervision can also be allocated by potential authorities. Um, and it's with the central bank because central banks have a keen interest in the well-functioning of financial market infrastructures for monetary policy implementation, uh, for ensuring financial stability, as well as for the confidence in the currency. And I think second, um, one can say that uh, the objectives focuses a little more on the macro perspective by focusing on the safety and efficiency of the payment system as a whole and that oversight addresses systems whereas banking supervision addresses banks as individual entities and this is quite i think quite important because with that also the standards and the approaches um, as well as analytical tools are potentially different um, and this may also be the nature because fmis are um, systemic entities um, they're providing a network and um, um, with that, providing the backbone of the infrastructure. And third, um, another distinction is potentially in the how. Um, so supervision may indeed be viewed as based on licensing, based on regulation, being prescriptive and using sanctional tools, whereas oversight um, is often based on more suasion to collect information, to, to make recommendations, and is based on principles. Um, however, I must confess that central banks also occasionally use regulation, and we did so also at CCB, where there's a regulation for the oversight of systemically important payment systems. But also here, it applies a proportional approach and looks at the safety and efficiency of the overall payment system. So I think in conclusion, um, one can differentiate the two functions, but they are closely interrelated. Banks are participating in FMIs. FMIs have banks as participants, so there's also, um, um, there's also room for synergies of the two 
and um, the understanding of, of the supervisor of FMIs and of overseers of banks is potentially uh, very helpful. Thank you, Patrick and Claudine. Would you agree, both? I mean, it, this is for both of you. Would you agree that oversight has to do more with the macro prudential approach to financial market infrastructures, whether uh, supervision is more micro prudential of those FMIs? On, on my side, and, and that's my opinion, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say so. I think micro prudential is yet at another level. We, I mean, as overseers uh, within the central bank, look very closely um, on the, let's say, on the micro, um, at micro um, uh, prudential level. Uh, for example, when we look at CCPs and the, uh, and the margins and uh, uh, all the, uh, the risk models, uh, however, I, I think uh, that we examine this uh, in the perspective uh, also of financial stability. And our financial stability concerns, which are the main concerns of a central bank, are really the drivers of our action. So, but we will not um, uh, work with the tools or the macro prudential tools. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, within Banque de France, it's within the remit of other colleagues. So I think that our goal is still, well, it is mainly financial stability and uh, we apply, let's say, micro, uh, micro prudential or micro prudential approach uh, to uh, individual FMIs. But I mean, this is, this is my view, so I will uh, let That's Patrick right. uh, tell his uh, opinion. Okay, so let's go to the uh, next question. And it has to do with, um, with a concept that I introduced at the beginning in the summary. Can we elaborate a little bit about the term augmented oversight, which in my, uh, from what I've uh, read, the first time that I saw this, uh, it was from Denis Bo, from the, the deputy governor of Banque de France. So perhaps Claudine, as it's Banque de France, let's start with you. I should say that uh, this uh, this concept has emerged uh, with uh, with new technologies and notably uh, with uh, with DLTs, uh, which are really changing the uh, the landscape and the uh, and the environment, and which uh, requires us to to have this uh, holistic uh, approach. Uh, hence, the term augmented uh, uh, augmented oversight. Uh, to encompass all the all the aspects and all the inter interconnections, notably um, uh, between FMIs and other actors, and um, the impact of new technologies that can have on uh, on FMIs as well. So we have to look at some specific aspects, for example, like uh, interconnections, uh, or aspects like uh, cyber and cyber resilience. So uh, with the new technologies new risk has all have also um, appeared uh, in the landscape. Um, so I think this, uh, this was well um, summarized by our governor, uh, Francois Villeroy de, de Gallo, who mentioned uh, the triangle of disruptions in our landscape, uh, covering uh, new actors, uh, new settlement assets based on the blockchain, and also new decentralized um, uh, market infrastructures. This means that there are new risks that we need to take into account when having uh, our oversight uh, approach. So this has to be, um, in order to, to apply this, uh, which is challenging, uh, perhaps a few uh, principles that need to be, uh, to be um, kept in mind, uh, that first of all, we need some enhanced cooperation between the authorities because uh, FMIs of these animals have become really uh, global. Uh, and so there needs to be a, a consistent uh, approach uh, throughout the, uh, the jurisdictions and the authorities. Uh, also, um, another aspect is to actually complement uh, the regulatory responses to innovation. This means that uh, also, regulation has to adapt to this uh, environment. Uh, hence, some welcome uh, regulation, for example, with uh, with Mika uh, coming for for crypto crypto assets and uh, uh, and all these uh, these new uh, elements. Uh, 
Um, third, that uh, central banks are probably uh, having a more and are more integrated approach uh, to, to oversight, um, looking at the interconnections between, between FMIs. And I think it's, an, it's a very interesting development. And this will also increase with the interconnections between the, uh, the traditional finance and, uh, and uh, decentralized finance. And uh, fourthly, and I think it's, it's also one, one interesting aspect, the use of new tools uh, which we, we need uh, to, to be effective in our, um, in our oversight, um, using, uh, for example, um, things like artificial intelligence or using uh, blockchains to carry out some experiments and to also, uh, as a central bank, to participate in, this, uh, in the change. So this, uh, this concept uh, covers all these, uh, these four, four aspects and uh, it's really, uh, I think it's an adaptation of, uh, of we as a central bank uh, to, to our, our changing environment. Thank you, Clemmy. Very, very interesting. Patrick. Yes, um, let me give it a try based on my technical problems that I seem to face. Um, and I think it's good that you gave the floor first to Claudine, because indeed it was said by the Deputy Governor of Banque de France, uh, Denis Beau. Um, but I take the opportunity to um, advertise um, a book from the ECB um, called Payments and Market Infrastructure Two Decades After the Start of the ECB. <laughs> from uh, July two, 2021. And in this book, um, 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 the deputy governor has contributed a chapter in particular about the oversight and augmentation of oversight. So then I put it a bit in different words, um, of course, um, um, than Claudine. Um, I think first there's a strong recognition and support of central bank's oversight and of its tools and also achievements, but also call that oversight and deeds needs to adjust to new challenges. And I think these new challenges, as we said already at the beginning, are in particular in the changing um, ecosystem. I think payments are, have been long um, an area for change, but currently uh, potentially in the last years for um, even stronger change. Change like um, new entities entering the market, um, entities that so far were not in payments, um, crypto asset discussions, of course, um, new business models, um, many of those related to aspects of digitalization and globalization. And of course, oversight needs to strike the balance between um, efficiency gains, innovation, but also um, the risks. And this can be potentially challenging because um, one may view it as being conservative or um, it requires that one is able to understand the developments, investing in understanding them, um, that we maintain our powers um, and our capacity in this changing environment. So I think the augmentation means in my understanding um, that oversight is ready and well prepared to face and manage these challenges. And I would like to give um, three um, aspects. The first one, um, I think we delivered in some areas. We delivered, um, for instance, a strategy for cyber resilience with some key uh, features like um, threat led penetration. Penetration test you with specific. Do you still hear me? To address um, the um, to address um, the, the new risks of, of the new cyber risks, um, we also delivered and um, the deputy governor nicely referred to it um, a framework, a new oversight framework uh, for payment instrument schemes and arrangements that is also meant to be future proofed and agile. Uh, second, um, it comes also that of course. Um, Overseers need to study and examine new developments, new technologies, new business models. And we do this also strongly through cooperation, uh, through sharing experience, and to investing in understanding um, what we see uh, in the developments. For instance, um, just now um, we did a two days workshop with overseers from all over the EU system in order to go through our 
new framework. And third, I think that's another aspect. A new framework can make use of new technologies for their own work. Um, um, and I think there are many fields of um, or areas where we can also try to use um, technologies, um, for instance, um, in the area of data analysis. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, regarding this, uh, we're going now to enter that type of the of the uh, augmented oversight in the sense that uh, we know that we have already the uh, PFMIs, I mean, the principles for financial market infrastructures by BIES IOSCO. And we know that they are the mainstay of central banks oversight functions. Obviously, we, we know that these PFMIs are, uh, are not new, are rather old. Uh, so they were designed to oversee financial market infrastructure that we know right now like traditional or mainstream uh, PFMIs. But to be able to, to, to have this augmented oversight, is it necessary to change those PFMIs? At the end, the question is, is are the PFMIs that we have today appropriate to oversee the new business models and technology that we are seeing in most challenger uh, FMIs? Claudine. Thank you, uh, Carlos. Again, a very good, uh, a very good question. Uh, are our PFMIs are old-fashioned or outdated? Uh, I would say no. <laughs> I'm a firm believer in uh, in PFMIs, and um, so there were. I mean, there was a history in the elaboration of the of the PFMIs because uh, it started. Uh, uh, it started. They started a long time ago. Um, uh, with the, the central banks, and they were um, um, epitomized first with the core principle for systemically important payment systems that was uh, back in 2001, uh, so over 20 years ago. And uh, then they were adapted, I mean, the principles were grew and were adapted to different types of infrastructures. And in 2012, there was this uh, overarching uh, um, document um, Covering all the uh, FMIs, and which is which was called yes the uh, the principle for financial market infrastructures, but these PFMIs have actually uh, evolved, and uh, uh, they've also been uh, refined in terms of uh, of new guidance. Uh, first of all, um, if I if I may uh, underline that they've been very useful, uh, notably in um, they have been um, let's say. Um, they have been uh, detailed and applied through regulations, uh, with the uh, regulations on the on CSDs in the EU, on uh, on CCPs with EMIR, and um, also on uh, on payment systems uh, with the uh, the regulation for the uh, systemically important payment systems. Uh, also, they have been a source of inspiration for uh, the recovery and uh, the recovery plans um, for, uh, for, uh, for CCPs, and they inspired the, uh, um, the, uh, the regulation, the EU regulation for, for, for the re recovery and uh, resolution of CCPs. So they're very, uh, very young, <laughs> still very young and very up-to-date. Uh, they have not uh, been, uh, let's say, affected by major changes since 2012. And we have seen that uh, even in some uh, very recent developments like uh, crypto assets, uh, for example, uh, the, the main function, such as the, uh, the transfer function, was clearly identified as being the, uh, the, the classical function of an, of an FMI. And this has made uh, stablecoin uh, arrangements uh, really um, good candidates to, to test and to, to, let's say, stress the PFMIs. And uh, the report was uh, published uh, some months ago uh, in 2022. Uh, so the CPMI report, CPMI OSCO report on stablecoin arrangements uh, showed indeed that, um, that PFMIs could be applied to such, uh, such arrangements. So I think it's a good sign and it's a good evidence 
that these are very still very uh, alive and very relevant. So of course there's some technical questions that uh, that arise, but since these principles are uh, let's say broad enough and they hinge more on the financial stability concerns, they're still very up to date, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Claudine. Patrick, how about you? Yes, thanks, Carlos. Um... So if the PFMIs would be a human, um, you would speak about um, a 10-year-old um, um, or 11-year-old person. So uh, they would be still very young. But I agree, you know, we're in different times. And um, in terms of standards, um, your question is, is valid. Um, I find it personally remarkable how well the PFMIs are working for new business models. And um, maybe also to um, just rest a moment and um, acknowledge that they really achieved a lot to set a common framework and it helped us to develop and harmonize oversight activities across different jurisdictions. So I think they are like a strong anchor when it comes to, to oversight standards and requirements. Um, and I think likewise important of the PFMI are the responsibilities for central banks and authorities that are forming part of the PFMI, but also these um, are um, very instrumental um, in, uh, in view of the uh, changes in the ecosystem. Um, I would say a certain challenge is, of course, to understand how the PFMI is applied to new business models. And that is also not always uh, uh, um, an easy exercise for overseers. Um, but still, it would not be prudent to say we should not look critically at the PFMI when new developments emerge. And I think this is also not the case. Um, first, um, a CPI Moscow are supplementing the PFMI. So throughout the years, we see different supplements to the PFMIs in view of challenges posed by evolving activities. Um, for instance, the guidance on cyber resilience, but um, there are also, for instance, oversight expectations applicable to critical service providers and further um, a supplements that came up uh, in, in, the, in the years since they were issued. Um, the second, um, the PFMIs are also examined in light of new developments. Um, I say examined, meaning um, that CPM OSCO looks at the PFMIs to see in how far they apply to uh, new business models. And I think in particular the work for stable coins and the, the issued um, 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 a guidance from CPM OSCO that confirms application of PFMIs to stablecoin uh, arrangements is, is, um, is a very good example um, of, of, of the work uh, to ensure that the PFMIs also work with new business models. Um, and this story is not, is not over and CPM OSCO uh, continue to um, examine regulatory, supervisory and oversight issues with stablecoin arrangements and also coordinate with other um, standard setting bodies. Um, but I think that this, this guidance for stable coins um, clearly showed that the PFMI um, are applicable and are um, a future proof. Um, and finally, um, I would also mention that CPM Osco, they, um, there's also work of implementation monitoring. So um, that is about the adoption, the implementation, and um, the outcomes of the PFMI. And I think this also provides um, um, a good way of, of feedback process um, about um, how the PFMI have and are working um, down to the level of the FMIs uh, in, in applying them. So I think overall, um, as said at the beginning, uh, they really provide a very strong anchor for our work and also our recent framework for the PISA framework um, um, is based on the PFMIs. Um, so we, we take also here the PFMIs on board and the principle-based um, developments plus responsibilities provide us with a, with, a, with a good framework. Great, Patrick, thank you very much. Next question is rather related to this one. Uh, it has to do with uh, how, what about decentralized FMIs. And there are very different kinds of animals. So is, uh, I mean, how is the oversight going to uh, oversee uh, decentralized FMIs if the part of their like business model is having no clear institution, which is doing what an FMI should be doing? 
What do you think, Patrick? Very good question. Um, not sure I'm going to be able to give you a conclusive answer, but um, let me try um, to, to share my views. Um, so I, I think a decentralized operational setup of an FMI will indeed give rise to oversight questions about governance and interdependencies. However, um, I guess the question is, what means decentralization? So the use of distributed technology does not mean that there's no central governance body. And um, actually, we see FMIs and we're planning to operate based on, on distributed ledger technology. making appropriate governance arrangements. Um, in Patrick, we lost you once again. It'll be decentralized. I will try again. Um, I'm a bit of technology. Um, um, so um, the, um, my point was, there may also be potential FMIs claiming to be decentralized in terms of governance. And, um, and at times, they purport a decentralized ownership and governance structure, but the degree of decentralization can vary. So, um, for instance, there may be voting or decision powers that may even lead in such decentralized governance structure to um, rather concentration of um, of, um, of, of this power. Um, I'm a, um, a supporter of, of being technology neutral in the approach, um, as well as to balance um, um, efficiency gains with risks. Therefore, my personal view is that um, FMIs um, must remain with um, a clear line of responsibility and accountability, while, of course, operations may be uh, decentralized. Moreover, I'm personally not. Um, entirely sure whether a fully decentralized setup, so in terms of governance, without any identifiable governance body is really fitting an FMI function and the expected risk mitigations from such an FMI. Um, a setup, a governance setup without any identifiable governance body would indeed not be easy to oversee and, and, to, and to directly oversee and supervise. Um, And potentially more in the direction, and this is my personal view of, of indirect oversight um, uh, via participants and users, um, as we also um, see it in in, uh, in several frameworks being applied. So this would be my take on the on the um, on that question. Thank you, Patrick. Claudine. Thank you, Carlos. I think I would quite agree with uh, with Patrick actually, and that we we need to make a distinction. Uh, between the uh, the technology uh, and the governance uh, aspects. Uh, so far, I mean, the two have been uh, centralized with uh, uh, FMIs having a centralized infrastructure, a centralized body, and using also a centralized uh, technology. So that's, ve that's very easy. And now what we start uh, uh, seeing is that uh, in FMIs, uh, potentially, you could uh, use some um, uh, technology which is um, maybe not decentralized, but, but I should say uh, distributed. Uh, I.e., it it does not uh, it's it can be it can rely on a network of uh, or nodes, for example, using a, using a DLT. Um, so this is one of the uh, evolutions that we currently uh, can foresee. Um, however, I think the main point uh, for overseers is really to ensure that um, 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 there is a clearly identified responsible entity, uh, because for, uh, for the oversight and for financial stability purposes, it's, it's very important to, to have this. Um, it would be difficult to apply, indeed, our PFMIs uh, if, uh, if we have uh, completely uh, decentralized uh, services. And I think that 
anyway, in any case, you still have some uh, clearly identified functions, for example, like the, uh, the transfer, um, the settlement, the recording. So these are the basic functions identified by the, uh, by the PFMIs. Uh, what you really need is the, uh, a clearly identified entity uh, that uh, carries, carries out this function. So this is definitely challenging in a decentralized environment. And this is why, I mean, I think that we would probably have to also to adapt and to see either if we, if we let's say, um, if we find or if we apply uh, the principles or if we, we could require uh, these functions to be carried out by um, clearly defined entities who are responsible uh, eventually with the, with the governance and uh, which can be uh, possibly, uh, let's say, sued if there is a problem or, or, or at least, I mean, you know, um, cater for, for the problem. Um, or we could also, and we could also look at what can be done in terms of uh, in terms of technology. Also, how can we find some hooks on technology? Like uh, maybe, uh, but this is uh, kind of prospective uh, thinking. Uh, can we, for example, regulate uh, smart contracts or protocols? Uh, because this is uh, this is very new. So, what I, I would say that what we need as overseers is. Uh, a clear definition of responsibilities and clear points of uh, control for uh, for such uh, new new types of uh, of FMIs and um, this is uh, I mean um, uh, regulation of course has to apply to these because I mean th these type of infrastructures um, have connections with the uh, let's say the traditional finance so they need to be regulated they need there needs to be uh, some responsibility. And so this is a, a big work that uh, lies ahead of us, uh, but we will certainly have to, to tackle this one. That was Great, cool. Claudine. <laughs> can, can, you re can you repeat us the three functions that you mentioned? Just to have... To uh, I, I mentioned the, the clearing, the settlement, and the recording as examples. Based on this, in these three functions, uh, I, I'll try to pack the three questions that we have uh, missing still in the three uh, for the next three minutes. Based on these three functions, I would say that stable coins should be subject of oversight. They clear, they settle, they register. Exactly. <laughs> okay, that's so I I, uh, I, yes. I already yes. answered like the next two questions. Patrick, do you, what do you think oh. about <laughs> stable coins are to be are to be overseen because of this? Uh, so stable coins in yes i would say um so let me uh, let me explain a little um of course um we mentioned now a few times mika the markets in crypto assets regulation um where you likely have all seen the drafts and um this regulation is 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 uh, strongly needed in order to regulate stable coins as e money tokens or asset reference tokens and um, the central bank oversight um, will, in my view, be complementary to the supervision of EMTs and, and arts. Um, and oversight will especially consider the aspects for the safety and sufficiency of the payment system. Um, as this may indicate, I, um, I share the opinion of CPMI IOSCO, um, as in the guidance that I mentioned before, that a stable coin arrangement um, should be treated like an FMI. Um, because of its transfer function. So when it enables the transfer of the stable coin between users um, um, and according to the rule of same risk, the same rules, then it should also be considered like an FMI and with that also be overseen. And even if determined by the authorities as systemically important, uh, it would then be required to comply with all the principles that are shown in the PFMIs. Now, um, from an ECB perspective, um, although um, I think we remain still in a theoretical world for the time being, um, um, I would tend to fuse and um, possibly would also could be qualified as a payment scheme 
or as a payment arrangement. That depends, of course, on the specific setup of, of, the, of the stable coin. But what I want to say is that um, with that, um, they would qualify to fall under the oversight and we would use our toolkit for the oversight of payment systems and for the oversight um, of, of PISA payment instruments and schemes uh, to apply them also uh, to stable coin arrangement, particular to the transfer function and potentially other functions that they may carry. And um, just to add here, because it's related to the, to the previous question that you asked, who would be target in that case, we would target the function and the governance, but um, so but in, in short, um, stable, stable coins um, um, would should fall under the um, also under the oversight of, um, of of central banks as it concerns the transfer function and potential other functions that are related to payments. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Claudine. Uh, next, I, I'll pack everything else on just one uh, question, the last one. Uh, can we uh, go to the next slide? Uh, there is a, what you're going to see in the next slide is the way that we are uh, thinking of, uh, though we don't have the slide, sorry. What we're thinking of uh, here at, the, at, at FNA is that the money and payments ecosystem right now is about uh, three layers of money, central bank money, commercial bank money, and new types of money in which we include e-money issuers and also stable coins because stable coin is a, some kind of e uh, of e-money issuer but it's like based on new technologies such as dlt or blockchain so what we can conclude from what we have discussed in the last minutes is that as they uh transfer value as they register as they clear and as they settle they should be overseen what happens with those stable coins and perhaps with those e-money issuers, which have a cross-jurisdictional nature, which are like in both sides or in, ah, that's the slide finally, which are in the in different parts of the uh, of, uh, of the world. How to oversee, to oversee those? Claudine. I found the unmute button. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's fine. Again, yes, it's a it's a challenging uh, new area. What we are seeing uh, now for the moment. Uh, what uh, what you show here on the on this slide is uh, is very relevant. Um, we see indeed um, a landscape with a, which is uh, changing with the emergence of uh, new types of, uh, of settlement uh, assets. Uh, so you have, of course, well, the, the traditional, the central bank money, which is the uh, safest settlement asset. Then you have the commercial bank money, which is um, also, well, um, meant to be uh, safe because it's backed by, um, it's backed by uh, guarantees, uh, so this is a mechanism that uh, helps also keep the, the confidence in commercial bank money. And then you have uh, effectively uh, these new uh, new types of um, of, uh, of issues of stable coins or e-money, and which are being under the uh, also the scrutiny uh, of uh, of regulators. So indeed, we see the, the emergence of a third layer, which is, uh, which is appearing. And um, the links between the, uh, the layers uh, are very, uh, very important. We have seen that in the stablecoin um, landscape, uh, stablecoins with no uh, proper uh, reserve assets or with uh, stabilization mechanisms only uh, resting upon algorithm, they they have collapsed like the uh, the Terra Luna. So <laughs> this um, makes us uh, come back to to basics that uh, indeed uh, stable coins or purported stable coins indeed would need to be backed by uh, actual reserve assets, and these have to be uh, controllable. They, their value has to be assessed. Hence the uh, the legislation that was. Uh, that was mentioned uh, by uh, by Patrick uh, with um, with Mika, for example, um, and the role of central bank is banks is indeed to ensure that the emergence of these new assets does not threaten financial stability, so that they do not become 
um, global, super, super systemic. And this was uh, clearly uh, uh, clearly shown in the uh, DM or Libra example, where I mean there was potentially the emergence of a super systemic uh, private uh, coin. Uh, which could uh, threaten the sovereignty of, um, of uh, some currencies, some um, uh, predominant sovereign currencies. And so this is why there was this uh, initiative also of regulators um, and uh, the uh, Financial Stability Board also to, to have a close scrutiny uh, on the stablecoin arrangements and global stablecoin arrangements with uh, some recommendations and the update of those recommendations, which is, uh, which is going on uh, for the moment. So um, definitely it's important that uh, central banks um, uh, are deeply involved in, uh, in the regulation and in the oversight of these, uh, these arrangements. But uh, I will let uh, Patrick uh, have his take also on, on, on the topic. Thank you, Claudine. Patrick. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, maybe maybe um, I reflect a little bit on um, on the question of um, if an FMI, like Shanja FMIs, as you mentioned them, is um, located in a foreign jurisdiction and um, what that could mean. And um, here, um, um, as, because I think it's, it's quite an, a, a relevant question. Um, and, and here, um, I would refer first also again to the international standards. And I mentioned before the importance of the part of responsibilities within the PFMIs. And um, I'm particular said this because um, there is one responsibility A um, that requires um, that each jurisdiction has clear um, conditions of how to identify an FMI and to make it also subject to the supervision regulation and oversight. And I think this is already an important aspect that the jurisdiction where the FMI is located is indeed um, applying regulation, supervision, and oversight. It not be sufficient. It requires a further responsibility, and that's a responsibility that speaks about cooperative oversight arrangements, meaning arrangements of cooperation between the central banks and, and other authorities in order to cooperate and to coordinate and share information about um, um, a specific FMI. And this activity, so to say, is not, is not new and we have cooperative arrangement to address as a provision of global services. This is a way of how to address um, a case of global services offered by an FMI outside um, the ONCO. Do not exclude that at times uh, see them, but here uh, the international community, the central banks uh, with other regulators are working together in identifying the cases and finding um, the, the proper arrangements um, to, to, to collaborate and to cooperate. Of course, Of course, I should all part of your transactions um, in a theoretical case uh, would be settled outside a zero area. That in, in, in such case, it would question the um, and, and endanger the, the statutory role of, of the of oversight, um, namely to cater for the smooth operation of the case, actually um, the system operator um, um, of the payment system um, should then also uh, locate in the jurisdiction of the central bank where the services are offered. Uh, um, so I think this would be my, a, a bit my take on, the, um, on this, this global offer as in concerns um, of, um, of oversight and who should be overseen or is overseen. Um, if I um, look at the picture in front of me, uh, we covered stable coins before. Um, we oversee payment systems, wholesale, retail, publicly owned, privately owned. Um, we may oversee 
uh, service providers of those if they're critical, whether directly or indirectly. And in particular with the new PISA framework that we have in place, um, we also oversee um, the area of payment instrument. It's not entirely new, we did this in the past, um, but to, we go a bit further because we also introduced here the oversight of digital payment tokens, at least of schemes and arrangements that are um, doing business related to, to um, digital payment tokens, and they also fall under the um, oversight of the of the um, of the system. Thank you, Patrick. Login. We have uh, reached the end of the hour. The one, I'm going to ask you a just no question because we have no no more time. Claudine, did we hear that you monitor cryptos and stablecoins? This comes from the Q&As. Do you monitor cryptos and stablecoins? Uh, we, we actually uh, monitor the, uh, the market developments. And what we do is that we, we, we contribute to the, um, uh, the, uh, the recommendations of the uh, Financial Stability Board. And we also contribute to, to, uh, to the elaboration of MICA. Uh, the ACPR, which is the uh, Prudential uh, Authority, uh, actually um, um, supervises the, uh, the crypto asset service uh, providers. So this is uh, yeah, a split of responsibilities. We do it as a, for financial stability purposes. We monitor market developments. Yeah, it changes, but that, that's great. Uh, and we, for sure, we're going to have a, another, this, another, another day to discuss this, but we can, I mean, you can oversee the exchanges, but not the issuer of Bitcoin or some other, because there's no issuer at the end. But that's a, a food for thought, obviously. So uh, we're two minutes past the hour. Thank you, Claudine. Thank you, Patrick. This has been a very interesting, a very lively discussion or conversation about what oversight is, should be, and will be. So we thank you very much for this. Uh, if someone from the audience wants to get in touch with uh, Patrick, Claudine, or myself, please, uh, you will receive the, the links to our uh, contacts or, or whereabouts in the, in the slides. Uh, this has been the end of the eighth FMI broadcast. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Please uh, be attentive that in February, we will have CBDC broadcast number 14 with BIS and Accenture, Subtech broadcast number five with Accenture and Oliver Weinwein, and FMI broadcast number nine with R3 and DTCC. Once again, Claudine, Patrick, thank you very much. Everyone have a very nice end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.